Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Dr. Rebecca Edelmeyer. She is the Senior Director of Scientific Engagement for the Alzheimer's Association. And we're going to be talking about some research and findings and other good things that have happened in the past year. So thank you for joining me, Rebecca. Absolutely. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Jennifer. You're welcome. So shall we just start at the top? And there's been some studies on air quality and how improving air quality can reduce our risk for Alzheimer's disease, which I can kind of guess as to why that is, but let's not go guessing. And I'll just ask you, how does improving air quality improve our cognitive fun function and reduce our dementia risks? So we've been really looking at a lot of different things that may drive risk across all populations. And, and when we think about those, we're thinking about ones that might be modifiable, things that we could change and things that might not be modifiable, not a fun modifiable, things that we can't change, like our age, right? Um, but when we look across the spectrum of things that maybe are possibilities of, of places where we can reduce our risk uh, and drive towards risk reduction, we're looking at things that, uh, for example, like air quality. And now we've been studying this for some time. We've learned of that poor air quality, as well as pollution may drive um, risk for individuals for developing Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. But this is the first time we're seeing at our Alzheimer's Association International Conference this year, some data that suggests actually improving air quality or reducing pollution over time may lead to lower risk for developing dementia or Alzheimer's. Which makes sense. And I, you know, with my zero science background, am very much convinced that Modern life is not good for our brains. You know, this, just stress and pollution and noise and not great food, not great food choices. I think there's a lot of things we could do to Im improve our, our cognitive well-being, our brain health. One company I work with has a slogan that says they want your brain health, brain span to last your lifespan. And I like that. So we need to all work towards that. But I had never heard that poor air quality might play a function, although it, when you think about it, it, it does make a little bit of sense. Mm -hmm. So what steps do you think we should be taking maybe as a cities, states, government? I know like, oh boy, we don't really want to, <laughs> don't want to rely on them so much, but what should we be thinking about pushing our leaders to do to improve air quality? And I think that's a great question. I think we need to start somewhere. And I think that really starts with research in the sense that we need to learn what this really means for all communities. You know, air quality is different across all communities, across the globe, really. And we don't have all of that data and research completed at this time. There's much more that we still need to do to better understand um, the risk across all populations across the globe. But I think when we learn more of that information, what it will help us to do is drive towards more effective strategies of um, improving air quality for all if we truly for, for all individuals if we truly find that this is something that's driving risk in, in populations over time and that improving that quality is going to drive down risk. So what we're looking for is multiple ways, I think, in the future to make sure that individuals all across the globe are going to have those strategies at their fingertips that federal governments, local governments will be able to incorporate that um, into their strategies for overall better community care um, across the, the world. Which makes sense. I think it's going to come down to local communities and local government. I am in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I am in a valley where the pollen filters in, doesn't filter back out. So we have a huge occurrence of seasonal allergies, which at this point with lack of rain is almost year round. For some people, I've lived here my whole life. So I feel kind of immune most of the time to those pollens and that stuff. But we also have the smoke that comes in from all the fires we have here in California. I also yeah. live in a, what was a exclusively rural community that grow in agriculture. So we also have crop dusting. So even though I'm in a smaller city away from things like airports and 
train stations and all that stuff. I would think that our air quality is not bad, but it, you know, maybe it could be better. Yeah. And so. that, that's, I think, I think you're right, Jennifer. And I think that's one of the things I want to circle back on is because those are things that, you know, you and I, it may be difficult for us to change our location where we live. Um, and, and we need, we will need bigger structures around improving air quality than just our own personal responsibility for that. And that's where we start talking about policies that might need to be implemented. And that's where the research will be important to make sure that we have the data to back that up. But there are going to be things that we can continue to do across our life course that maybe we have more personal responsibility for and can change. And a lot of that research focuses on um, things across our life course around education, even um, our uh, physical activity, nutrition, diet, these types of things may be things that we can control a little bit better. Hope so. That's my goal. Because I have a three generation history of cognitive um, decline on my mom's side of the family. So I am not going to be the fourth generation. So you did talk about some personal things that we you know we might be able to do. That was kind of my last question, unless I missed anything you wanted to throw out there. But what steps maybe should we do in our personal lives, in our homes, businesses, maybe to improve air quality? Because I've read that sometimes the air quality in our own homes is not great. You know, like sometimes the air is better outside, although not always in, not always where I live when it's, uh, you have orange skies and smoke all over the place. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a perfect answer for you, but I think one thing that maybe I would suggest to individuals at this time is it might be good to be able to learn more about the air quality that exists for you and your family around your lo the location where you live. So there might be strategies in place within your communities that you could also reach out to to find out that information. And they may have some suggestions because it might be dependent on where you live. Like you said, pollen might be an issue in your area, but pollution might be an issue somewhere else. So I think that over time, um, as we learn more from the research, we'll be able to give I think more effective strategies to each individual person um, and that will be most impactful, I think, for their, their health and their family's health moving forward. That sounds fantastic. And it makes sense. Is there any last, well, a quick question first, and then I'll ask this. <laughs> How long is this research continuing? Do we know? Oh, as it's a ongoing for, Yeah. <laughs> As a scientist, I think my answer is the research will always continue. We were learning something new every day. And especially in this area, this is a little bit of a newer area for looking at the relationship, I think, between sort of cognition and air quality and air pollution. This is not a space that we've seen a lot of research at this time. And um, we, we, need, we need to continue to see more. At our Alzheimer's Association International Conference, we've seen some research over the past few years, I would say, that's mostly uh, what they would call epidemiological or observational. They're looking at large bits of data around different countries, different communities. Um, but again, I think until we know more globally um, all of the sort of risk factors that are, are being driven um, by air quality, or I would say we need to know more globally whether or not dementia is being driven uh, by risk factors like air pollution. I think we we need to still continue to do that research um, every day. I agree. Plus, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I like to tell people if I was half my age and had twice as much scientific aptitude as I have currently have, I would probably go into brain research because I think it's fascinating. Fortunately, I'm more artist than scientific. So you guys wouldn't want my help. <laughs> we need everybody's help. We need everybody involved for sure. I can just ask all the questions because I'm I'm just very curious. So that kind of turns us to our next topic, which is on education. And they feel that education is expected to degree decrease global dementia cases by 2050, which is good because I'll be in my late 70s. And what I've I've read that people with Alzheimer's or other dementias that are also very intelligent generally have more coping techniques to get around the memory issues. And so sometimes in those people, it feels that their progression is very rapid because we don't, know, they have so many good coping tools that once they run out of those tools, all of a sudden now it's like, whoa, what's going on with our loved one, which is I always found really interesting. 
but what role does education play in, in like brain development and our cognitive health? That's like a really, that's a big, that's a deep question. <laughs> so I think this actually gets back to something I touched on where we're trying to learn really what drives risk across all populations. And the, the risk can fall into categories that, as I mentioned, are things that we might be able to change and things that we might not be able to. And, and education does fall into the things that we may be able to change. And there has been a, a significant amount of research that's been, been done around education because it's one of those things that you can actually follow um, from the very early young ages. And at least you can follow through data around children's development through school systems and how, how many years they've been in school. Um, and whether they've completed higher education. We've see, we see a lot of that data for a lot of different countries. Um, but in terms of what we're seeing about education, it does suggest that for many individuals, more education does seem to provide sort of a benefit to our cognition across a life course. Now, that being said, that is something that we're still learning more about because it's not necessarily also just about the number of years that you uh, are educated. It's also the quality of the education and the access to education that we need to continue to learn more about. So while education is something that might actually decrease dementia prevalence, um, it may be counteracted by other things that are also increasing or driving uh, dementia risk. And we see that in things like um, poor cardiovascular health, um, high blood sugar, um, smoking, obesity, those are the things that are, they're kind of counteracting each other. So while education may be beneficial and supportive of cognition, these other factors are driving something that is really going to be against what we would want in terms of, of risk prevention or risk reduction. Which makes sense because you're, that's a lot of damage you're doing to your system with the, the sugars, the smoking, processed foods all of that stuff. I talk about that a lot because I've been on a, I went on a very large weight loss journey to avoid the diabetes on my paternal side of the family and then discovered that I was doing my brain a very big favor. So you touched a little bit on early education. Do we have any idea or indication if early ed education is more important for brain health than lifelong dynamic learning or should we just keep challenging our our brains, like maybe I should go into science for you. <laughs> and that's a good question. Again, I think that um, we are learning that certainly early education is, is beneficial, beneficial um, at a younger age um, from the outset. And again, that's something we can kind of follow for, for many different countries and for many different individuals across time without having to do invasive research on them, right? We can look at, we, we can look back in history and understand what their education trajectory was. And then we can look at them now, maybe they're 75 years old and understand, are they in a situation of developing dementia? You know, what are they living with today? So that's where education can be um, very beneficial. I think um, what we would like to see though is more research to better understand exactly what the recipe is for education at an older age. You know, when is it still going to be beneficial? What type of education, whether it's formal or informal, there's a lot of that research ongoing and you alluded to this idea, you didn't use the terms, but you alluded to the idea of cognitive reserve or, and resilience. And these are some topics that researchers are, are, are really investigating right now to truly understand what biologically is changing in the brain when we're talking about education and cognitive stimulation that may actually help protect our brains across the life course. And so there's much more that still needs to be learned um, when it comes to education and what the right recipe for that is across the life course. But I think that we're seeing research every day um, that's really helping us to define that. I've learned that, you know, obviously from birth to, I'm not sure what age, early twenties, I believe that we're constantly growing new neurons. And it was assumed that after a certain age that we stopped that, but that opinion has changed. So that's why I asked, you know, if early education was more important than lifelong learning. And I'm kind of getting the idea that we should just learn as much as we can for as long as we can. <laughs> Keep our brains wow. active. Yeah, challenging our brains, I think, is important. I think it's never going to hurt. It's never too early to start, and it's never too late to start. That is kind of what we're, we're going for with that conversation. It's keeping yourself challenged socially and cognitively. There is definitely research that's ongoing 
The Alzheimer's Association is actually leading a clinical trial right now called the U.S. Pointer Study that is really testing a multi-domain approach to risk reduction. And it includes sort of better management of nutrition, your physical activity, your social and cognitive engagement, and um, as well as sort of management of your heart health factors, because we know cardiovascular um, disease is also another risk factor. So as we learn more about that recipe for success, we, we hope that those will be strategies that all communities can use. I had a conversation with a friend who recently started using a CPAP machine and discovered that his blood pressure decreased, which is good. And I said, you are aware that heart health is the same as brain health. And he had not heard that phrase. And so when I explained to him that the more oxygenated blood to his brain was good and it was making his heart work less hard, that's not very good grammar, pardon me. It was, we had a very interesting conversation about heart health and brain health being intertwined on almost like un, you can't separate them. So is there anything else we need to know about um, education and global dementia cases before we move on to our last topic? Oh, well, I think you kind of started touching on it. I think some of what we're seeing at the, at the AAIC this year is going to be trying to better understand too, not only about education, but what is driving uh, global prevalent prevalence of dementia. And um, when we think about education in the context of what we're speaking about today, we're also seeing not only dementia cases increasing, but we're also seeing increases in mortality, increases in death. And many people don't realize that Alzheimer's disease is a fatal disease and we don't like to talk about it, but it is. And some of those um, um, things that we are seeing at the, at the conference this year is showing that numbers are increasing in terms of mortality. And that mostly is driven by demographics. We're, we're growing into an aging population right now, right? And age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's. But as we talk again about some of those other things that are driving um, increases in mortality, we're also seeing that there may be some disproportional, disproportionate impact on communities that do not have access to things like education or have poor uh, access to healthcare. And that gets back to your cardiovascular health points that if we're not taking good care of our hearts across time, we're not receiving, uh, we're, we're not benefiting from access to some of these other things like education, we may be in a situation where there's communities that are disproportionately affected by dementia and even are dying uh, at higher rates from dementia. So that's something that we need to continue to learn more about, again, to drive towards more effective strategies for all communities. And we do know that people of color have a higher risk of Alzheimer's and dementias. And maybe some of these things we've discussed already play into that. There's a lot of things. I've had a lot of conversations with people in those communities. And there's a lot of things that I think are driving it, but whatever we can fix would be terrific. Which may, brings us to one last community that I have not had a lot of conversations with, and I'm going to have to change it. But we've, they're also studying how transgender adults are more likely to experience subjective cognitive decline and depression. And so can you explain Explain just so we all are on the same page what subjective cognitive decline is. That's not a term I'm familiar with. Yeah. So when we talk about cognitive decline, it really is something that occurs across a continuum. And subjective cognitive decline really sits at the front end of that continuum. So we're, we're cognitively unimpaired. Um, but we may move into stages if we're moving through phases uh, uh, towards cognitive decline of subjective cognitive decline, which is a time when this is really more self-reported um, changes that you're experiencing in your cognition, your memory, your thinking, but they may not yet show up as any uh, significant changes on maybe a cognitive test that you receive at your doctor's office, but you know something's not right. You can sense it. And then you may move into phases of what they call mild cognitive impairment. That's again, some, some changes that you're experiencing. Maybe they're sort of starting to affect some of your activities of daily living, but still not still not completely um, impairing you from, from doing everything that you used to do. 
And then you move maybe into phases of dementia, mild, moderate to severe stages of dementia. And that's really impacting your activities of daily living. So what we're talking about right now is subjective cognitive decline. This is some of those earliest stages where people are noticing change. And as we know, in Alzheimer's and other dementias, it's so critical that we start having conversations about those changes at the earliest time points with our families, with our physicians, because we know that early detection and accurate diagnosis are going to be the most beneficial to people that are at risk for developing dementia in the future. Uh, you, I tell the story frequently that my, we had a family business together and my mom at 52 and a half would occasionally take orders from clients and not write down due dates or instructions or anything of benefit. And then they'd cut the client would come in to pick it up and we'd be like, Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oops. And it was very easy to dismiss it as, Oh, well, somebody else came in, the phone rang, she needed to use the restroom, whatever. It was very easy to dismiss, but it started happening more and more. And it was much harder to write it off as something normal. And one of the conversations I've had in the somewhat recent past is a friend of ours was kind of doing the same thing. And her husband was kind of giving her the business about her mind and how she was scattered and, and he was making comments, but I, he was also concerned, but it was, she's, she puts too much on her plate. She's stressed out and her mind is all over the place. So it's, it's natural. And it was very easy again to, to just dismiss as normal. And I told him that is how my mother started. I am going to keep an eye on her. And thankfully, like five or six years later, she's still fine. But it helps to have these conversations so that people realize, you know, this is out of the norm. Okay, it's easy to dismiss, but maybe we should pay attention just in case. Because, you know, prevention is a lot easier than dealing with Alzheimer's. So the back to the transgender adults now that we've Define mm -hmm. subjective cognitive decline, which I like that term. Now I've, I've learned something new today. It's very, very helpful for me too. The study you're referencing looked at mood and cognition in transgender and non binary adults. Do the results also apply to cisgender adults? And I ask this because I've read that low levels of depression have also been attributed to cognitive decline, which I also think was one of my mom's issues. That was a long winded question too. <laughs> so depression definitely applies to cisgender adults as well. And it, we've seen that some mental health factors like depression can be a risk factor even for developing dementia in the future. Um, and it's really important that people continue to keep those health factors in check with their physicians. Um, but when we're talk, what we're really seeing in terms of the research is that over the past few years, we're starting to see some of the first research come out um, in communities and, and understanding really the experiences with dementia uh, in the lesbian, gay, and bisexual communities. We saw this over the past few years at our international conference. But what we're seeing new this year is what are those experiences for individuals that are transgender? or um, are by, uh, living as part of the bisexual and, um, and gender non-binary communities. And so what they are seeing is that these individuals are actually reporting uh, more subjective cognitive decline uh, than, than their cisgender counterparts. And we are seeing that individuals who are non-binary and also transgender are reporting more depression as well. So then their cisgender counterparts. So, that's that's um, new information. We've never actually seen this before in these communities. And did the study look at basically systemic discrimination as a possible cause of the obviously the depression and the cognitive issues in this group? Well, I think the studies themselves did not specifically look at what was causing some of these, um, the prevalence that we're seeing in these communities. That's definitely a next step. So a great point. But what we do know is that that type of health disparity and in terms of individuals access to healthcare already exists for these communities. We know that systemic discrimination does exist for these communities. So we're learning that these individuals are not necessarily getting quality health care from their, their clinical communities that they, that they are embedded in. And, and that's something that really does need to change. 
Um, so I think what we first need to do is identify um, the issue, and then we need to come up with the strategies to make sure that there's culturally competent healthcare being delivered to all communities. More learning for our medical community. <laughs> So one question that I hadn't written down but popped into my head is we know that there may be a hormonal connection to Alzheimer's in women. Have they looked at any of the hormonal treatments? I'm not sure if that's the right phrase for the transgender community, if that's affecting their, their cognitive health at all, or is that, that down the road too? Um, there's no evidence to date to suggest that undergoing gender reassignment or taking hormones increases risk for dementia at this time, um, though we know that hormones may play a role in how our brains are, are operating overall. And so there's a lot of research that's still ongoing to try to understand even the differences between um, the, the sexes um, in terms of, because we, we do know that there's more women than men that are living with Alzheimer's disease today. And we still don't know what's driving that. There may be biological factors like hormones, but there may also be other types of factors, social aspects that may be driving some of that as well. Or probably a combination of all of the above. <laughs> probably a combination. <laughs> I've always said that, you know, people think that space is our final frontier. I disagree with that. I think the brain is our final frontier. I have a feeling we know more about space than we do about the workings of our brain. It sounds like we're, we're working on fixing that. We are. I actually think I'm going to steal that from you. I think that that's a great, um, I think that's a great observation. And I, the brain is fascinating. It's incredibly complex. And there are so many things that we do still need to learn, because I think that there are so many individuals around the world that are living with Alzheimer's, living with some other form of dementia. And we need to be able to continue to do that research. It's going to help us find really effective strategies and solutions, not only for their treatment, but also their care. I fully agree. I appreciate you spending much of your precious time with me today. I think that my listeners will benefit tremendously from this conversation. And is the conference that you're the international conference that the name is slipping my mind at the site right this second that Alzheimer's. So it's, it's, what is that? What is the name of the conference? And is it open to non science people like myself? Yes, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference is taking place in uh, about two weeks now. Um, and so that we, it is open, it's really, uh, really is meant to be primarily for a researcher and clinician audience, but there is the possibility if people are interested in attending, it's a hybrid conference this year. Um, so that people can attend virtually if they're interested. And, and just so you know, there is a a no cost virtual pass. If people want to get a flavor of the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, um, and they might be an individual that is living with dementia or caregiving for someone with dementia, um, they're more than welcome to join us and they can, they can watch some of the plenaries, which are some of the biggest talks that are happening uh, throughout the conference uh, the week of AAIC. Awesome. I appreciate this tremendously. And I will be on vacation. So I do not know if I'll be able to pop in, but Maybe I'll just attend in person someday. That would be wonderful. It would be great to meet you in person, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.